All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Oh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, uh, tonight we're actually going to probably look at a few different suttas. Um, so if you're following along, um, in the Dharma Doors for a while now, we've been exploring this Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses or the connected sutras or suttas. And last week, we moved to like a new section of the Samyutta Nikaya. We moved to the section on the what's called the Sad Ayatana, the six senses, or sometimes called the six sense bases. So we moved to that section, but I actually actually kind of jumped pretty deep into the to the section on the sense bases and we did a sutra basically kind of like one of the most famous of the early suttas last week we did the fire sermon the aditya pariyaya sutta and that is probably that's probably the most famous sutta that comes from this section so I started with that one because it's sort of, you know, one of the greats in that way. But tonight, what I wanted to do was move to the beginning of this section and kind of start from the beginning. So if you happen to have the big wisdom publication edition, I'm going to be over on page 1133. At least that's where we're going to start. This is going to be the very first sutta in this section. So really quickly, though, uh, actually, I don't know, it might not be quick. Before we do this, though, I do want to talk about a, a word. I didn't really talk about this word last week. We just sort of dove right into discussing it. And so I thought today or this evening, we should kind of start with that. So I want to quickly mention the word or the idea of an ayatana, this idea of what, you know, it's being translated or referred to as a sense base. You could call it a sense organ. That's another way. But here's the thing about it. So in Buddhism, especially the kind of early form of Buddhism represented by the Samyutta Nikaya, in terms of what we would think of as the sentient subject, like being, being a sentient being, for the Buddhist tradition, this here goes for you too, but this here is an amalgamation or an aggregation of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, a body, and a mind, or kind of a brain. And those are the sad ayatana, the six ayatana. Now, again, normally that word would be translated as a sense base. But let's talk about the word ayatana. So the word, it kind of literally, at least in terms of the way that it's used other places, an ayatana sort of is a, a place, just a place, a, a location in that way. And by extension, we use the idea of a sense base. I suppose that translation in terms of a base, like, I guess, like a, like a baseball diamond and you have bases, those are locations. So that's kind of the way they're using ayatana. But there's sort of a trick or a problem with this. And what it is, is that there are six other ayatanas six other places, six other locations. What are those? <laughs> well, 
They are visible forms, which correspond to the eyes, sounds, which correspond to the ears, scents, which correspond to the nose, flavors, which correspond to the tongue, tactile sensations, which correspond to the body, and mental objects known as dharmas that are the object of the mano ayatana. That is the Buddhist kind of word for the mental faculty or specifically though the mental organ is the mano ayatana. And again, the mano ayatana, the brain mind, corresponds to mental objects or dharmas. And so again, visible forms, sounds, scents, flavors, tactile objects, and thought objects are the six. And tonight we're going to be referring to them as the six external ayatana. And so it's important that you know that in the world of Buddhism, there are 12 ayatanas, six that are in that are called internal and six that are external. And those are, again, the 12 ayatanas. The sutra that we're going to do tonight, or the first one we're going to do, is about the internal ayatana. And you kind of have to be a little, well, you should just know that this word, what is it? Aji, aji, ajahaka, ajahata, internal. They don't, they don't mean specifically like inside. It's just the idea of the, the six ayatana that correspond to the sentient subject and the six ayatana that correspond to the sensory objects in that way. So that's what we're going to be talking about in depth tonight is those 12 realms. And yes, sometimes within the world of Buddhism, they refer to these as the 12 realms in that way. All right, so that's the th th things are getting complicated already. It's like, yeah, we're only we're just going to be talking about the six senses, by which I mean the twelve ayatana, and then of course, <laughs> there's six more realms, or these would be referred to as dahatu, at six realms. And these are the six vijnana, the six consciousnesses. But before we even kind of get into the sutra tonight, I want to kind of mention something about this. So, yes, a, some of you have heard this before, but it's an important point. So let me get something. <clears throat> So I'm going to tell you um, it's a it's a made up story. <laughs> this is just a funny story, but it's to make a certain point. All right. So and actually, uh, yeah, there's a few things that are going to go on in here. So my funny made up story is <laughs> I went to the music store because I wanted to buy some, I wanted to listen to some music, right? Now, I, again, I want you to play along with me. This is sort of, you know, just a hypothetical, funny story. But I went to the, the music store and I told the, the guy working there, I was like, yeah, I want to listen to some music. And he goes, sure, yeah, we got music. And so he pulled out one of these. A record and he was like yeah there you could listen to one of these there's music <laughs> and i said great and so i bought the record and took it home i kicked back 
And I was I was ready to listen to the music. And so I couldn't hear any music though. The guy told me there was music on the here, but I couldn't hear it. So the next day I went back to the record store and I said, hey, there's no music on here. And the guy said, well, do you have a record needle? And I went, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, what's all this about a, a record needle? And he said, you need, you need a needle. You need a record needle. Like basically he said, you need a record player, but the most important part is the record needle. And I said, oh, I didn't know that I needed the record needle. And so I bought the record needle to go with my record. And I came home and you know what I did? I did what the guy at the record store told me, which is that I took the needle and I put it into contact with the record. And then as this one started moving around, I could hear the music. And you know what happened? The music was coming out of the needle. So I went right back to the record store the next day and I said, hey, you ripped me off. And the guy's like, what do you mean? And I said, the music doesn't come from here. The music comes from the needle. I don't need your stupid record. I need where the music comes from. So I gave him back his record. I went home with my needle all ready to kick back and listen to some music. <laughs> but the music wasn't there anymore. Um, yesterday, it was there was music coming out of the needle. I went back to the record store and I said, what's going on here? And he said, oh, yeah, you need both. You need the record and the needle. And so when the record and the needle come into contact, there arises, there emerges music. No contact, no music. So that all made sense to me now that you need both the record and the needle to make the music. Well, that example right there is my example in terms of what happens when an eyeball comes into contact with a visible form. When there's a sense organ and a sense object and the two come into contact, there emerges what the Buddhists call a, an awareness a vijnana. So when the eyeball comes into contact with a visible form, just like music, there emerges a visual awareness. It, it would be called a, a, a chaku vijnana, eye consciousness. But as soon as the eyeball is separated from the object, there's just no more visual awareness. It's just like the music. Now, here's the here's the reason why I walked you I walked us through my funny story about buying the record. It could seem <laughs> as if <laughs> a visual awareness it could seem as if the visual awareness, it could seem as if the visual awareness is coming from the object. But then if you kind of start thinking about it more biologically in terms of like the retina and the optic nerve and the way we actually see, the visual images arising, it would seem 
that it is arising from the eyeball, not from the object. But that's exactly like my record and my needle. The visual awareness is not arising from the eyeball or the visible form. It's arising from the contact between the two. And again, that is going to be called a vijnana, a kind of awareness or consciousness. And there is visual awareness. There is auditory awareness, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, and then mental awareness. Now I got to mention something and really quickly, I got to remind you of this because it's tricky. Let's go back to my record and the needle real quick. So as you know, or as you, I hope you know, or I, I presume you know, the music, the sound, the, the particular sound is very much related to those grooves, right? So you have this vinyl and you have these grooves. So the the shape, the shape, the form, literally the form of this record. Well, the form or the grooves are part of what ultimately becomes the music that is heard. But I want you to think about this. So needle, object, sensory organ object, contact music, right? But I want you to notice that if I were to change the form, if I were to change the shape of this record, and then I put these into contact, notice that the music would change. So if I change the form of this, the music changes. But if I change the needle, the music will be different as well. So if I change this, different music. If I change this, different music. You know what that's a lot like? It's a lot like the eyeball, which is, which is shaped or formed a certain way, and then a visual object that is shaped or formed a certain way. Now, if you're seeing my teacup here, then there is a visual awareness arising because there's contact. Now, if I changed the shape of my cup, if, if somehow I went in and I like changed the shape of it, then of course your visual experience, your visual awareness of the cup, it would change accordingly. Like if I punched a hole through it, then your visual awareness would change accordingly and you would see a hole through it, right? But also, if your vision was blurry because you were nearsighted and meaning that you could see the cup, but the your particular visual awareness is blurry. It's like fuzzy. You know what you could do? You could go get a procedure done. They call it Lasix. And what they do is, is they, they shoot sound <laughs> at your eyeball and it goes brrr, and it warps and changes the shape of your eye. And you know what happens as a result of that? Your visual awareness changes and things are now more clear because you've changed the shape of your eye. That's like changing the needle and getting different music. So what we need to understand, especially like if we're studying Dharma, if we're studying Buddhism, we need to understand that a visual awareness that is arising is dependently originated based on both 
the sense organ and the sense object. And so the final product cannot be said to be exclusively the sense organ or exclusively the sense object. It's a unique visual form that arises in the consciousness that is unique to the visual object and the organ that is seeing it or hearing it or smelling it or what have you. What I want you to notice or think about is that normally, normally we just think of the eyeballs as like windows, that they're just, that the, the visible form the you know these these shapes we just think that they're out there and the eyes are just these windows through which the visual forms are flying into our brain but phenomenologically the organs are fabricating their own kind of version based upon their particular rupa their particular shape or form and I talked about this last week regarding the ears, which is that if you had really big ears, you might hear really well. But if you have like tiny ears with like cauliflower kind of bent over, you might not hear so well. So the shape of your organs determines or it's one part of what determines the conscious experience. So. Now we've dealt with the six sense organs, their corresponding six sense objects, and then this idea of a vijnana or a consciousness that arises when there's contact between sense organ and sense object. Now, what that means from a Buddhist point of view is that right here, right now, what you are experiencing right here, right now, is the culmination of everything that you are visually in contact with right now, everything that you are in auditory contact with right now, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile. And so all of those sense organs are plugged in. They're in contact with their sense objects. And so you have five different consciousnesses <laughs> emerging based on that. And there's the sixth sensory organ, the brain, basically, that's back, way back in there. And it's a sensory organ too. But it's a sensory organ that comes into contact with the vijnana of the eyes and like whatever it is producing as a visual sensation, that's what the brain is sensing. And whatever the ears are fabricating as a result of being in contact, the brain is back there sensing what the ears are creating. And the brain is also back there sensing what the nose is creating and it's sensing what the tongue is creating, and it's back there sensing what the body is creating. And then because the brain is now in contact with those sensory impressions from the five organs, there is contact and the arising of a what is called the mano vijnana, the sixth sensory consciousness. And the sixth sensory consciousness, what we call the brain, is the sensory organ that senses the visual impressions of the eyes, senses the auditory impressions of the ears, nose, tongue, and body, and then stitches those together into what it thinks is the object it is experiencing in that way. Everybody with me? The sixth sensory organ 
that's back there sensing the sense impressions of the other organs and then stitching it together into a present experience? Yeah. That sixth, what's called again, the mano vijnana, that sixth sensory organ consciousness can become very confused. And in particular, it can start thinking in terms of a self, in terms of a, a me. And that is what, what is called the klishetta manovijnana, the afflicted or defiled state of the sixth sensory organ, the manovijnana. So that's kind of what we're going to be dealing with tonight. Any questions about six senses, six sense objects, or these six consciousnesses? Yeah, Maria. So would it be correct to think of objects as characteristicless until they come in contact with we come in contact with them and then those characteristics are only appear based on our equipment and our conditioning. I'm so glad you brought this up, Maria. So Maria mentioned this idea of characteristiclessness. But tonight, Maria, we are not going to talk about characteristiclessness. And it actually, I want to remind you that characteristiclessness is very much kind of a Mahayana Buddhist idea. And with these sutras, especially the sutras in the Samyutta Nikaya, this is the early form of Buddhism. And so I'm really happy that you asked the question the way you did, because tonight, although the Dharma talk Although it is about the six senses and six sense objects and all of that, tonight we actually are going to be talking about what are known as the three marks of existence. Now, that's the official way that this is, is translated. The three marks of existence. But what this teaching is, is that it's called basically the Trilakshana, the three Lakshana, the three characteristics. I want everybody to be very aware that this teaching of the three characteristics that we're going to talk about, it's very much the hallmark. It's very indicative of the early Buddhist tradition. And I'm going to explain sort of why that is or like why or how the Mahayana sort of eventually transcends this idea of the three characteristic marks of existence. But tonight we want to talk about it because it's important. So really quickly, the question of Lakshana, of characteristics. So... Maria, your question, at least sort of like where you were or where I feel like you were going or, you know, why you were asking about that in terms of the characteristics of external objects. Tonight, we do and we are going to explore the idea of characteristics, but I need you to know something or I need you to remember something. In the early form of Buddhism that we're talking about, and, and it's kind of very explicit actually in the sutras that we're gonna read, in the early form of Buddhism, there, there really is very much the physical body of sensory organs, and there is very much an external world of objects and things independent of the observer. This is a really important thing about early Buddhism. Early Buddhism still believed in the 
objective, independent existence of the external world. It's only in the Mahayana tradition where the actual existence of such external objects and reality is drawn into question. And we ultimately come to what would be kind of eh, ultimately the teaching of emptiness, which negates the objective existence of anything, especially external things in that way. Okay, so we need to know that in the early Buddhist tradition, there's very much um, uh, what, what I call the sensory meat bag. So early Buddhism did believe that there was a set of eyes attached to a set of ears, attached to a nose, attached to a tongue, all wrapped up in a body with a central processing unit <laughs> tucked in there that was kind of organizing it all. Early Buddhism believed in that model of a sensory meat bag and believed that the sensory meat bag was wandering through a world of objects and things and coming into contact with those objects and things. And then there's a consciousness arising from that. The most important thing I've said so far tonight that I might not have stressed that I would like to stress. If you remember my, from moments ago, if you remember my example of the record and the needle, contact, music, no contact, no music. In all forms of Buddhism, consciousness is like the music. And what I mean by that is, is that when the conditions are, when the conditions are present for there to be consciousness, there is consciousness. But when the conditions are no longer present, it's not that consciousness recedes back into the brain. It, in the same way that the music doesn't recede back into the record. My point is, is that in Buddhism, consciousness is always an emergent property. It has no location. It is not in the brain. It is not outside. And what I mean by that is, is that tonight, and I probably should just get to the sutra, tonight we're talking about the physical world of what is called the internal, the senses, the physical world of the external, the objects, Everything else in Buddhism is not physical, meaning vijnana is not a physical phenomena. It's not in the physical realm. It's not in the physical plane. You can't put it on a scale and measure it. You can't put it into a computer and download it. It's not of the physical realm. Okay, so I just wanted to make that clear that in Buddhism, consciousness is first, an emergent property, and second, it has no physical location. It's a emergent phenomena in that sense. Okay, let's look at the sutra, and then we'll have more to talk about. It's a it's a pretty short sutra, which is why I think we might do more than one. But again, I'm on page eleven thirty three. This is sutra number one in section thirty five. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was dwelling at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, those bhikkhus replied. And the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, the eye is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is 
with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. The, the bhikkhu also thinks the ear is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is not self. What is not self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This, this ear here, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. The nose is impermanent. The tongue is impermanent. The body is impermanent. And the mind is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom like this. In terms of the mind, the mind is not mine. This, it, this I am not. This is not myself. Seeing thus, bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple experiences viraga, non-attraction towards the eye. Viraga towards the ear, non-attraction to the ear, non-attraction to the nose, non-attraction to the tongue, non-attraction to the body, and viraga, non-attraction towards the mind. Experiencing this viraga, experiencing this non-attraction or revulsion, one, be <clears throat> one becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated, and one understands. Destroyed is birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. Okay, so that's the first little sutra. In terms of what we've been studying in Dharma doors for a while now, this is kind of totally in line with everything we've been looking at now for weeks and weeks and weeks, because we've been exploring, I suppose the theme that we've been exploring is this idea of developing this kind of viraga. You could translate that again as revulsion or just a non-attraction, but we've been talking a lot about, again, for weeks, this practice of not identifying with or as the body. Now, weeks and weeks ago, we were in the section, we were in still in the Samyutta Nikaya, but we were in the section on the five skandahas, on the five aggregates. But the message was the same. Bhikkhus, the noble disciple does not identify with the aggregates, with the body of form or sensations or perception or conditioning or consciousness. Now that we're in the section on the six sense organs, the message is the same message. Bhikkhus, the noble disciple does not identify with or identify as the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, or even the brain. And why? Because those are all impermanent. They are anicca. In the, in the Pali language, the word is anicca. In Sanskrit, it's anitya. Same word, just a slight different pronunciation. But this idea of impermanence, 
this is one, this is the first of those three characteristics of existence that all phenomena, everything is anicca or anitya, impermanent, decaying, falling apart, not lasting very long. So actually, I can I should mention it because they are all present in this sutra. The other two lakshana, the other two characteristics of existence, the first is that all things in the world, all phenomena is impermanent. All phenomena, everything is suffering, dukkha, and all phenomena, all objects, everything in the world is anatta or anatman without a self, without a self being there. So those are the three characteristics of existence, and they were all mentioned in this little sutta I just read. The noble, is it? Yeah, the noble disciple is to contemplate how the I is impermanent, suffering, and not self. How the ear is impermanent, suffering, not self, nose, tongue, body, and then even brain as impermanent, as suffering, as not self. So let's start with talking just quickly about anicca or anitya impermanence. I find that this is probably the easiest of the three characteristics to, to talk about because in the modern world, and by the modern world, I mean in the world of modern physics, it is a law, it's a law of thermodynamics <laughs> that things are impermanent. So the Western scientific mind that is thinking in terms of physical laws and principles already be believes or already understands impermanence entropy, that things are always in a state of decay and change in that way. Now, I want you to kind of appreciate that at the time of the Buddha, this teaching of impermanence was much more radical than it is today. And it's because we, I think that we, because of, again, of, of modern physics, are have become very comfortable with this idea that everything is kind of impermanent. And we actually might not be comfortable with it, but we understand it as like, what's going on in that way. Marnie, you have a question? Yes, please, sorry to interrupt. Hopefully it's quick. Totally, so yeah, no worries impermanence, though. I mean, when I think about it, I think, you know, disappears, not permanent, no longer here. Um, but. What I'm hearing from you, and hopefully it's the same thing because, you know, matter cannot be created nor destroyed, is that ultimately things will change form. So is that what you're, we're saying the same thing then, right? Yes. Yeah. So let me, let me give you just one quick example and I'll try to deal with what you're, what I feel like you're getting at, Marnie. So it has to do with, um, well, let's say, for example, when I was young, I had very blonde hair. As I've gotten older, my hair has turned gray and white. So the idea is, is that my blonde hair that I had as a, as a younger person those hairs have fallen out. <laughs> They're gone. They, it was impermanent. Now, Marnie, what I understand you talking about is the idea, but those hairs went somewhere else and maybe, you know, little bugs fed on them and it, and the hairs became food for little bugs. And that's the idea of sort of energy not being created or destroyed. It's just kind of moving around in that way. But what we're talking about is my blonde hair 
that isn't here anymore. <laughs> those those hairs might still be off, off in the world, but they're not part of me anymore. But you are not you. There's no self. <laughs> Indeed, Marnie. But it, don't get we're we're getting there. I we're just sort of going to deconstruct about why that is. But yes, totally. Okay, I think I'm with you. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So impermanent sort of, yeah, means ever changing would maybe be the kind of way to put it for Marnie and the way that she's thinking in that sense. So, okay. So that's impermanence. By the way, one of the things that we should really be thinking about is yes, the physical realm we should be thinking about that and thinking about the physical aspect of what we think is ourselves. But the one, one of the things that the Buddha seems to really be talking about when he's talking about impermanence, he seems to, because he talks about it a lot, he seems to be talking about the impermanence of things like emotions and thoughts. And what I mean by that is, is that what you are experiencing right now is not what you were experiencing yesterday. All of those experiences from yesterday arose, you experienced them, and they subsided. Now, if you're having a memory right now about things from yesterday, that's happening right now. That's an arising of a thought about yesterday, but it's an arising of a thought about yesterday right now. And tomorrow, you will not be having this thought. <laughs> you, you'll be having tomorrow's thoughts tomorrow. So the Buddha is sort of talking more about the very, very ephemeral, arising, experiencing, and then ceasing of thoughts, emotions, and things like that, and how fleeting all of that is. That's what we should really kind of be thinking about in terms of impermanence, even though, yes, the physical body is impermanent as well, and all things related to it are impermanent as well. All right. Any more questions just about the impermanence? By the way, I need to mention this because I didn't. I thought I did, but I just realized I didn't. I never finished that thought from 20 minutes ago. It's about these lakshana or lakana in Pali. So there's a, a number of different ways to translate lakshana. You could translate it, I, I translate it as characteristic. It could also be quality, the quality of something, the characteristic of something. I want you to know though, that it is also back in like the older days, like the early days of Buddhism in America or Buddhism in English. Lakshana were transited as marks, and that's where we get this language of the three marks of existence. Signs is a popular one, and that's like a very um, kind of semiotics way of thinking or language way of thinking is to talk about characteristics or Lakshana as signs. But th so those are the major in translations of this word Lakshana characteristic quality mark or sign that's sort of the family of words that are used in english but what we need to think about though is is for, forget the words what are they referring to like what are we talking about well what's interesting about lakshana lakshana is it's how you distinguish whatever it is you think you're looking at. For example, we'll go back to this one. If, if you think that you're looking at a 
a record at a 45 vinyl record right now? Well, why, why would you think that? Oh, because it's round. Oh, because it's flat. Oh, because it has the characteristic big hole in the middle. It has all the characteristics <laughs> of a record. And because it has those characteristics, you think it's a record. You don't think it's a teacup because this has the characteristics of a teacup. It's why you might think it's a teacup because it has those characteristics. So characteristics are qualities of things. But let's look at the quality of things, or let's look at some lakshana, let's look at some characteristics. What I want us to think about is this. Let's take a characteristic like beautiful. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? And the idea about that is, is that let's, let's say, let's say I think my teacup is beautiful. What I might think, I, I would be confused about this. I would be wrong about this, but I might think that the beauty, the beautifulness I might think that it's a quality or a characteristic of this cup, the, the beauty. The problem with that is what happens when somebody comes along and they think that this is ugly. What happened to the beauty? How can the beauty, how can the beautifulness be here if somebody else sees it as ugly, ah, therefore the quality, the lakshana of beautiful, of what is that? Chavri, I believe in Sanskrit, that idea of beautiful, it's not here. It's emerging a lot like the music that we talked about earlier. That very idea of beauty is arising dependent upon a mind conditioned a certain way to find certain things beautiful and a phenomena that matches that. And when they're in contact, there is arising the sense of there being something beautiful there. But you would be confused. You would be deluded in thinking that the beauty was in the cup, but you would also be deluded and confused if you think the beauty is in the mind. That would be like thinking that the music is in the record or in the needle and not recognizing that the music is an emergent phenomena upon the contact between the two. In other words, then the beauty or the ugliness is an emergent phenomena and it emerges in between the two. But it, again, it would be deluded or confused to think that the beauty was either in the cup or in my brain in that way. Everybody follow me on that idea? So that's the way in which lakshana or characteristics can be tricky meaning that we often think that the characteristics of things are out there when they're not out there. You know what another great example of this is? And by the way, I want you to notice that we're moving, we're moving from this really kind of like overt gross level of beauty and ugliness. I'm going to take it down a notch. Let's talk about colorblindness. It's another great example of emergent phenomena. The point is, is that I might have 
an apple. And I might see the apple as a red apple. But somebody else with a different set of eyes, a different form, a different shape of eyes with different rods and cones, with different sensitivities to different spectrums of light, those eyes might see a green apple. I'm seeing a red apple, but they're seeing a green apple. I would be, if I see a green apple, I would be deluded. I would be confused if I thought that the greenness was an inherent property of the apple. But I would also be confused or deluded if I thought that the greenness was a property of my eyes or my mind. The greenness is what happens when my eyes come into contact with that apple and there emerges a sense of greenness. But in another set of eyes, there emerges the color red. And that reveals that, ah, even the characteristics, the lakshana, the quality of color is not actually out there in that way. Okay, so before I, this gets too far along, ultimately within kind of the world of Buddhism, early Buddhism, by the way, and this, I want to point that out in regards to Maria's question about absolute characteristic listeners. In the early Buddhist tradition, what they will say is that all characteristics of things, beauty, ugliness, but also the really basic things like size, shape, color, all of those characteristics are not actually inherent properties of objects out in the world. In the early Buddhist tradition, they say that all phenomena in the, in the world, which includes the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain, all phenomena in the world actually share three characteristics. They all have these three characteristics. You will not find anything in the world that is not impermanent, that doesn't cause suffering, and you will never find anything in the world in which there's a self there experiencing it. Those are the three real characteristics of anything in the world. All other characteristics, like again, beauty, ugliness, size, shape, color, all of those characteristics are delusional, especially if you think that they are out there objectively in that way. Okay. We've talked a great deal about impermanence as a quality of anything and everything. And this is something, by the way, this is something like all of Buddhism, like all of the Dharma. This is something that we shouldn't just accept blindly. This is something to actually consider in terms of, huh, are things impermanent? Can I find something in the world that's not impermanent? Again, it's something to think about, not something to just accept blindly in that way. That's going to be especially true when we talk about the second characteristic, the idea of suffering. All right, one sec. So the second sorry that out of the way. The second sutra in this section is called, the, the first one was called the internal as impermanent. The second sutra is called the internal, which is the sense organs, as suffering. Now, it's actually basically the exact same sutta that I just read, bhikkhus, the I, is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self 
should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom. It should be seen by saying, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And the same should be for the ear. The ear should be regarded as suffering. The nose should be regarded as suffering. The tongue, the body, and the mind should be regarded as suffering. And what is suffering is non-self. And what is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, that none of this is mine. None of this am I. None of this is self. And seeing thus, one understands and develop, develops this viraga, develops this revulsion towards the six sense organs. So it's the same sutra, it just leaves out the whole thing about impermanence and just deals with suffering and no self. So let's talk quickly about dukkha. So really quickly, if you haven't heard it from me, it's nice. I think it's important to know that dukkha, what is translated as suffering, is actually sort of one side of a spectrum. And the other side of that spectrum is called sukkha. Sukkha means bliss. Dukkha means suffering. There's an expression in Sanskrit that is called sukha dukkha. And sukha dukkha is a expression that describes the entire range of human experience from the best to the worst. So it's, there's bliss in, you know, there's experiences of bliss and there's experience of suffering, sukha and dukkha. At the time of the Buddha and still to this day, it is a very kind of common, popular approach to life, to being in the world. It is a very common, popular thing to try to maximize sukha and minimize dukkha. Maximize pleasure, minimize pain. That is a very kind of common way to be in the world. All right? And even at the time of the Buddha, everybody was trying to maximize sukha, minimize dukkha. Even those crazy, long-haired, naked yogi meditator people that were out in the forests of India doing yoga and meditation, even though it would seem as if they were punishing themselves, they were actually pursuing Sukha. They believed that this world was hell. And so they were trying to get out of here to get to Brahma, to get liberated, to get out, to get Sukha, to get the bliss. So the Buddha, he meets all of these people. He starts studying these types of yoga and meditation that are trying to escape the world of suffering to try to get to sukha, to get to bliss. Bliss, by the way, would usually be a, a heavenly realm, a heavenly abode. After studying all of this, these different systems of sukha maximization, The Buddha went off by himself. This is, of course, a famous part of the story of the Buddha. And he came to his enlightened state. And his realization is summarized in the teaching of what is known as the Four Noble Truths. But the first of those Noble Truths, the, the main kind of thing that the Buddha seems to have realized that he told everybody right away It's all dukkha. That's the first noble truth. It's all dukkha. You will not find sukkha over there, 
You will not find bliss over there. You won't find bliss any of these places. It's all dukkha. That's the great truth of Buddhism. That's like the good news of Buddhism. Now, what I'm getting at is that in this sutra, the Buddha says, yeah, the eyes, yeah, they're suffering. It's all suffering. The ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, thinking, the mind, all of that is suffering. Now, I need to really quickly explain what that means. Because I don't want to leave anybody, I, I, I really don't want to leave anybody with a bad taste in your mouth in terms of that Buddhism is pessimistic. Allow me to explain. My understanding of the teaching of suffering is that it is about any kind of pleasure or any kind of bliss, any kind of happiness any kind of happiness that is derived from things, from seeing things, from hearing things, from smelling things, from tasting things, from eating things, from touching, from being touched, from thinking, any happiness that comes from things is actually suffering. That's the Buddha's realization. And what he realized is this. Ah, oh, yeah. That works provided you have that thing. As soon as you don't have that thing, you no longer can be happy. You can no longer be in bliss because your happiness or your bliss is dependent upon seeing something, hearing something, tasting, touching, and thinking about things. The Buddha, which by the way, the Buddha talks a lot about sukha. He talks a lot about bliss. But you know what it is? It's the real sustainable bliss that comes from not needing anything for your happiness. Not being dependent upon anything and being sovereign, being independent. The Buddha said, that is actual joy. That is actual sukha, to be independent. Any kind of joy that is coming from something, you are just a slave to that thing, and it is a semblance of joy. It, it, it appears joyful, but it's not actual joy. And it's not actual joy because one, as soon as that thing is gone, you can't be happy because your happiness is dependent upon it. But there's an even deeper problem. The deeper problem is that when I condition myself to receive joy from things, I condition myself in a way that makes it impossible for me to just be joyful. You know, just to be joyful. Not joyful because of anything. Not joyful dependent upon anything. But just joyful. If we condition ourselves to be dependent upon things, we are cutting ourselves off from that real joy of sovereign independence. Marnie. So with that said, the Buddha was not independent. He required other people to sustain his life, if you will. What does independence truly mean then in this context? Uh, it, I would, if, if we weren't short on time, I would go grab a beautiful poem. It's a Buddhist poem, uh, but I won't, but I, I will answer your question though, Marnie. So indeed, 
this physical body is dependent upon ahada. Ahada means um, uh, sustenance. And this physical body is dependent upon sustenance. I will give you that, Marnie. And so in that way, yes, in order for the physical body to continue, the physical body does need to be fed in that way. And of course, the Buddha is why was wise enough to understand that process. But what we're talking about, Marnie, and we've been talking kind of tacitly about it all in the evening, it's about identifying as that body that needs to eat. And what I'm really getting around to, Marnie, is that the so the poem, the poem that I wanted to go get, it's actually from this beautiful collection of early poems by Buddhist nuns. And there's a poem there about a nun who basically, I think it says that it's like her third day going out begging for food and not getting anything in her bowl. And it's this beautiful short poem about how it's like another day, another empty bowl. And as she's basically, it sounds like kind of dying in that way where she's sort of starving and she feels herself about to, to faint. And she has a gr this realization, it's so beautiful. She says, ah, and then I realized I was the grain of rice being offered as she fainted. And that poem captures kind of the answer to your question, Marnie, which is that the Buddha and these really enlightened Buddhist followers, they had transcended this dependence upon the physical body. And so even though, and there's stories, there's also stories about descriptions of the, the Buddhist practitioner dragging the corpse around, <laughs> meaning they know that they are not this body in that way. And so the Buddha, in, the Buddha, the mind of the enlightened one in that sense, Marnie, was completely independent, even though, yes, of course, the body to survive was still dependent upon food in that way. That makes sense, Marnie? It makes sense, but I think that we could go down rabbit holes. So thank you. In, indeed, indeed. Yeah, Noe, you have a, a reply to that or something to add? Well, no, that was, that was I love that poem. Uh, this conversation of bliss is this is this is liberation. This is what he means, you know, because it doesn't come up in the following in the in the dukkha, but you know, expressing uh, becomes dispassionate. This dispassion, uh, his mind is liberated. The mind is liberated, and when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated, and Not this is bliss. Hmm? Not I am liberated. Right. And, and and in one of the practices that I think I got from, I think from you, who knows, this is not the body. This is not the mind as a, a way of preparing myself for concentration. And then the thing that comes up for me is this word chitta. Hmm. Chitta. Could you explain a little bit about chitta since we are talking about is this chitta is the mind? Or Great question. It? Thank you. So I have been using this word a lot, this idea of the mind in that way. So I've mentioned this before, but always worth repeating. A technical word like chitta, excuse me, a technical word like chitta, it, you have to be really careful with it in terms of in a lot of different Indian philosophy and yoga systems use the, the idea of a chitta or mind differently. And the Buddha and Buddhism 
it's really, really important to understand this kind of use of the language. Last week, when we were talking about the six ayatana, the six bases, we read quickly, I think I even read it really quickly. It was a little sutra called The All. And that was about the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the brain, six organs and the six consciousnesses. That's all there is. So what is chitta then in that? Like, so is, is it a sense organ? Is it a sense object? Is it an aspect of vij vijnana? Like what is chitta? What is mind? Well, that's where we need to remember that in the Buddhist tradition, chitta translated as mind is definitely not a noun object. Chitta for, for me is best translated in a Buddhist context as a mind state. And the point is, is that the Buddha describes a state of mind. A state of mind can be anger-filled state of mind, a desire-filled state of mind, a delusional state of mind, a contracted state of mind, a distracted state of mind. And so that is actually about the six sense organs and their six sense consciousnesses and then that gestalt, total sense of awareness. And then that's your chitta. That is your state of mind at any given moment. Meaning you're in a state of mind right now, Noe, and it hopefully is a joyful, happy one. And this state of mind thinks it's Noe. Yes, thank you. It's, I, now I recall the fire, mm. the fire mind, the that from last week. Thank you so much. The question about chitta is really important, though, because I want to remind you that there is a key term in the world of Buddhism, which is bodhicitta, the awakened mind, the awakened state of mind. So there's the anger-filled state of mind, the you know desire-filled state of mind, delusional state of mind, contracted, distracted, and there is an awakened state of mind. And that, again, is bodhicitta. Yeah. All right. So really quickly, let's just do the last, or not the last, but one more of these. So this was going to, this will be the third of the suttas in this section. And this one is called the internal, which again refers to the senses, the internal as non-self. And it get, it's an even shorter sutta because it just says bhikkhus, the I is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom. You should see it as this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. The ear is not the self. The nose is non-self. The tongue is non-self. The body is non-self. The mind is non-self. And then the rest of the sutra is the same. So really quickly, this one I find, I think this is kind of, it's easy to understand, but it's like, it's really kind of tricky. So when it's talking about, for example, this idea of the, that the I is, and let me, let me repeat it again. So it's this formula that this, this eyeball here is not mine. This I am not, this is not myself. Well, all you have to think about is this. What if from, you know, through some, you know, 
deep, unfortunate accident, you lost an eye. Would you think that you died? <laughs> no, you would say, I no longer have an eye. I presume that that goes for both eyes. <laughs> so you already, you already think this way. You already think that your eyes are not yourself. Now, one problem though is you probably are still holding on to them as my eyes. But what I want you to notice though is that you think you have eyes. You don't think that you are eyes. And I showed you that because you could lose an eye and you wouldn't think that you have gone out of existence. You wouldn't think that you've died just because you lost an eye. So you're not the eye. And I assume that goes for the ears. I assume that goes for the nose. I assume that goes for your tongue. The body is tricky. I will give you that. The body is a tricky one in that way. But if I lost a finger, you wouldn't think you died. If you lost a hand, you probably wouldn't think that you no longer existed. If you lost an arm, you probably wouldn't think you no longer existed. Therefore, you don't think that you are any of this. And I presume that goes for this. And I presume it goes for the legs. You could probably imagine maybe getting an organ transplant, right? Like, let's say your heart, you know, let's say you had an unfortunate heart problem. And by a miracle, you got a new heart. You would still think you're you, right? But just now with a different heart. So it doesn't sound like you actually are the physical body either. That just leaves the mind. And then I would ask you, okay, are you yesterday's mind? Or are you this mind? Because yesterday's state of mind is gone. It's It would be law. It's gone like as if you lost your hand. It's gone. So are you that mind or are you this mind? Once again, there's a probably a deeper underlying problem here, which is that you might not think that you are your eyeballs and your ears and your nose and your tongue, but you might still think of them as your or my ears in that way. So now that we've kind of complicated this in terms of, oh, and this is another one of those things that I don't want you to just believe. I want us to explore this. This is called, you know, Vimamsa. This is Vichaya. We are investigating dharmas and we are asking ourselves, yeah, what am I? What is this phenomena that thinks it has eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and a mind. What is this me then, if it's not the body in that way? Now, this is of course the entry point to the world of spirituality, which is that different spiritual religious traditions have a different answer for what that is that self that has a body. In the Indian world, the real self that just has this body, but will eventually have a new body, the self, the true self, that is called the Atman. And that is what in India people believed was that which has a body, not the body, but that which has a body. That's the Atman, that's the true self. Well, the Buddha came along and the Buddha's great realization 
is that there's no self, no Atman. In other words, the realization is that there isn't a thing that has a body. That is a delusion of the klisheta mano vijnana, the defiled sixth consciousness, thinks in terms of self and thinks, I have eyes, I have ears, I, I, I. It thinks in terms of I when there really isn't such an I. And that's the teaching of anatta or anatman. And that's this kind of last characteristic here is that there really isn't a self, but there's this delusion of one. Marnie? I think I'm on the same page with you. One, basically the person who loses an eye, et cetera, has to die to, for a new person to live um, physically, whatever. And as someone who just went through back surgery, has a complication, has damage to my body, I am not the person and never will be the person before I had the surgery. So hmm. it's kind of a paradox. One must die to live. I hear what you're saying, Marty. This teaching's a little, mm, I want to say it's a little more subtle than that. And I want to try with our few remaining moments, I do want to try to point at it really quickly. So the example that I've used a lot to try to talk about this is, I want you to think about, and I've used this, I use this example a lot. And what it is, is, it's so I, I can, I can think that this is my cup, that it's like, it's mine. I own it. But let's look at that really, really carefully. What, do, what does that mean? That it's my cup, that I own it, that it's mine. What, what does that mean? I, and I know that like, you know, I could maybe have like some, uh, some documentation, a receipt, right? But what I want us to look at is what is that? that mental attitude or that mental disposition that thinks in terms of ownership or what we would call appropriation. But I want you to notice though, I can think this is my cup. Like I can be under that impression all day and all night. But what I want us to notice is that the only place that ownership exists is as a kind of disposition in the mind. If you know what I mean, there's no actual ownership. But what I want us to notice is this. If, 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 if I am under the impression that I own this, and that it's mine, pay very, very close attention to what happens when somebody comes and steals it. There can be the arising of mental anguish because somebody stole my cup. So there's dukkha, there's all kinds of anxiety and suffering arising from my clinging to the cup that is now gone. But watch this. What happens when I don't own the cup? Me, and what I mean is, is that I am no longer under the delusional impression that I own it, that it's mine. Look, a cup. 
I want you to notice that when the mental disposition or the mental attitude towards the cup is one of not owning it, but just there's a cup here, notice that when somebody comes and takes the cup away, no dukkha, no suffering. Why? Because I wasn't under the delusion and the attachment that it was mine. If somebody came and chopped my hand off, yeah, there's not only going to be pain, there's going to be a tremendous amount of suffering from my hand, my hand being stolen from me in that way. But notice that if my mental disposition towards all of this was not one of ownership, notice I could lose, or it, whatever, could lose the hand. And then it would be that, oh, now there's this, <laughs> right? Oh, now there's this. By the way, there's a very, very famous story. Oh, it's already past 8.30. But there's a very famous story of the Buddha. And by the way, Marnie, this is sort of also a response to Marnie's question from a while ago. There's a very famous story of the Buddha, and it's actually from a previous life of the Buddha. He wasn't even the fully awakened Buddha yet. But what happened was, is that there was a, a king named the King of Kalinga, a vicious warlord. And one day the king brought all of his wives out to the woods to, you know, have a party basically. And they all were drinking and eating. And eventually the king fell asleep and all of his wives got bored. And so they went off wandering in the woods and they came across the Buddha. Well, the being that would eventually become the Buddha. And the Buddha was sitting there meditating and he saw all these women appear. And so he started to teach them the Dharma or started to teach them, you know, and then the king woke up and he was alone and his, his property, his wives were gone. And so he was very angry and upset about this. So he goes storming into the woods and finds all of his wives seated around the Buddha or around the being that would become the Buddha. And the Buddha said, please have a seat. And the king so furious took out his sword and chopped the Buddha's hand off. And you know what the Buddha did? He said, no, really, have a seat. And the king cut his other hand off. And the Buddha was just trying to calm the king down, trying to get him to sit, sit down. And the king proceeded to eviscerate the Buddha limb by limb. And the, the moral of the story is that the Buddha never developed animosity towards this person, but only had compassion for them. It's a story about the level of the Buddha's detachment from his body and the level of compassion for the bodies of others in that way. So as I was chopping my hands off in this analogy i thought i would mention that story so all right everybody that's gonna do us for tonight um we didn't get as far along as i thought so i think we're gonna keep going with this subject next time otherwise unless there's any last minute comments questions or ideas thank you so much michael Ooh, my pleasure noe as always i'm happy to be here Happy to share that Dharma. One was, that one was wild, Michael. Thank you. So <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thanks, Lane. I appreciate the comment. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Maria.